I'm Dan Luttrell, if you don't know me. Uh, and this is a lathe. And it has a new feature that I hadn't seen, but, and you probably, you may not have, you may not have either, uh, but it's got a swing away for the tail, tail stock. And uh, thought we might want to look at that first. I was a little worried about it being so small and, and what happens if I try to rip it off of here, but it does have a stop, even though it comes all the way out here. There's a plate across there, so you, so you bring it to that position, lock it down, unscrew this to a degree, and there's a spring to help you down with it. Uh, what we found out was when this is full of tools, and, you know, it will come open, so be careful of that. Uh, the other thing we found was when this knockout bar is over here in this position, it won't open. But, so you put the knockout bar in this position, bring it back up, and it, okay, come on. Oh, there's a spring in there to, you gotta compress to make get the thread started. Dan's going to turn one of those next month. <laughs> yeah. so, so, now, so now we've got our knockout bar in here. And we, oh, oh, yes, we can. Oh, it, it will, it will come out. Okay. Hurts your hand, but it comes out. All right. All right, so much for the lathe. All right, so, don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, I got this from Julia Child. This is a bowl of balls. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a little history here. I was doing threaded boxes uh, because I also have the Baxter threading machine and nice, nice little box. Uh, and I thought that'd be nice hanging on a Christmas tree, but it's a little heavy. So I thought, well, I, I need to figure out how to make them lighter. So I started, uh, that got me into how do I make them lighter and, uh, well, piercing, obviously, and I've weighed these, you lose about 75% of the material. So after you turn them thin so you can pierce them, then pierce away 75% and you've got something that'll hang on a white pine for that matter. Uh, I had some early things that uh, didn't go very far. Uh, I wanted to try something green, so I got a cherry burl and uh, then let it warp. It, uh, the joint held, but it ain't pretty. Yeah. Uh, I was doing some baby rattles, some with handles, some without quarter inch hex nuts. I thought uh, a world globe would be nice. So uh, cherry wood kind of represents the dirt when you carve it out and you see the inside. Uh, the blue is the ocean. And I thought, oh, this is going to be nice. I painted on Antarctica. Uh, and then I started carving. I got in North and South America there and, uh, and Australia. And I looked at Eurasia and said, boy, did I mess that up. Alaska ain't nowhere close to being here. So, so there it is. It's been many years, and it's still in that condition. Uh, I thought, you know, there's holospheres is what I call the things. And then I started variations. Uh, elongosphere, okay, elongated sphere. And, well, what about a flat sphere? Uh, so some of those, and you could, I did this in two different versions, one this way, looked like Star Trek, and, and then you can do them this way also, so either way. Uh, then I thought, well, you know, I want to put things inside of them, and I wanted to put a square inside a sphere, and my square, uh, you know, a, a square has six corners, except for mine, it only has four, 
so it turned out to be a square donut. Uh, I put it in anyway, okay. I still own it, nobody else wants it. Uh, so other things inside, I thought, well, okay, how about round things inside? So uh, there are seven layers here. That's my version of Chinese balls. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Anything interesting? Oh yeah, other things inside. I figured out you could put a perch through here and, and glue a bird to it. And uh, people have commented that he can fly through those holes. The holes are too big. <laughs> uh, I've done some other things uh, most recently. Last Christmas, figured out another way. I had a nativity scene that was really nice and I finally figured out how to make a platform for that. And uh, a friend of mine bought it immediately. in progress. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine bought that immediately for his wife, and uh, so I started doing other things, and some of you have seen them, some of you have a couple of them. Uh, I, I found out that CA glue and glass doesn't mix very well, uh, and I think Chuck Mosser is an expert on that. I need to speak with him. Uh, I pulled this out of the box, and all the marbles had let go, so uh, I lost my marbles. Okay. <laughs> You've been around me before, right? Uh, the baseball came back. I, I did a couple other baseballs, and I didn't particularly care for burning the lacing in it. So I laced my own this time. Oh, oh look at that. It even bounces. <laughs> yeah. They're actually... Uh, yeah, it's a... Yeah, think of what you could do to this with a baseball bat. <laughs> so, if anybody would like to feel some of these things. Uh, How did you thread the one that was screwed together? Baxter? No, Baxter. I, I have one. Okay. Uh, and I'm assuming you, you made your, your box first and then done your design on the, with your baseball? Uh, Yes, absolutely, and that's, that's where we're going to go now on how to make a holosphere. Uh, I, uh, for, for the ones with the little hanger nub on the end, uh, I was trying to figure out how to save wood. I was using baseball bat blanks at 36 inches long, and how do I use that effectively? Uh, I, I got it down to where I could do it out of five inches of wood, so the five sevens is 35 and a few cuts. I could get seven pieces out of a baseball blank. So this piece is five inches. And somewhere along the line, you need a radius gauge. Uh, and if you want straight grain and matching grain, uh, you should take this off of the end first. Uh, but it's a whole lot easier to put chuck spigots on here and take it out of the middle if you're not worried about matching grain. So anyway, uh, after you do these for a while, you've got lots of different sizes in the cabinet. You just pick one that matches the piece of wood you're doing and go, <laughs> go for it. Uh, so, five inches of wood. Ring-a-ding-a-ding-a-ding. And... Chuck spigots. Uh, I had this old set of craftsman tools I got from somebody, and it had these two scrapers in it, so I dedicated these to chuck spigots. One for this end. And I don't do necessarily all three sixteenths of an inch at one time. Uh, and I know I should have a gauge made for this, but I don't, I just adjust the calipers every time. By the way, if you haven't done this or not familiar with it, make sure you round these corners over so this thing doesn't grab 
Hello. So that one will go in that way. Uh, and I've got it sharpened in two directions that will also go in this way on this end. Opposite hand. We'll use the other one. And then it will also go in this way, on this end. So four functions out of two tools. So five inches of wood will find the center. And since I'm going to put a nub on one end for hanging, I need a little more on one end. So a quarter inch off of that. That uh, will make a half inch difference, I believe. Is that right? And I'm not used to these buttons. Which one am I looking at? That one. I don't like things flying off of there when I'm parting them off, so. Yeah, well, I found out this works a lot easier, and since I'm gonna lose that anyway, that's not, now, now here's one thing, when, when you do this, matching grain, you don't wanna lose a lot of wood, so try to get that as clean as you can to start with. You certainly don't want any saw marks on it that you have to, to turn away, but, uh, the center is not a problem. I can just twist that off. And uh, we'll get rid of that. Um, all right, what to do with it? Oh, there it is. All right, so this is the top, this is the bottom. We're gonna do the bottom first. And I have maybe eight Nova chuck bodies and I've got four different systems, but they all work. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get that over here a little bit first. And we're going to flatten that surface, take away as little wood as possible. Shear scrape the end, and shear scraping end grain does in fact work. We want a good finish, and we want to make sure that it's at least flat. You don't want a gap when you put these two pieces together so you see the glue line. It's acceptable most of the time to have the outside touching at this point and you can fill the inside with glue, but you don't want to see a lot of glue on the inside anyway. You're going to pierce the surface away. You're going to see it. This is what you're looking for. So we got that pretty good. Check it for flatness. Make sure it's uh, at least angled in the right direction. And that looks pretty good. Set my dividers just a little bit smaller than my radius gauge.
And be careful you don't stick this point into it or, or you'll get it back in the face. I've got new things to learn with this lathe. And then we can start half of a sphere or a hemisphere. Bring that out to the line we just grabbed. out some wood we can go different ways here I like to uh, create a little bit of bump right there a little bit of flat it's really a good time to start thinking hemispherically Now, I should be nowhere close, but I like to check often. So, uh, draw a center line through your radius gauge. Put it on the center of the piece. And, of course, I had a little nub there to get rid of. I've got approximately 5 sixteenths to go uh, to get to the bottom. And sometimes it gets locked in here, but... Uh, here, we've only got about one sixteenth to go in the major diameter. So you've got to taper your cut, of course. And I use a little bit of an Ellsworth bump. It, it works well in something this small. And I really tried to create one here, the biggest bump I could get, uh, because it, it gets the point of the tool out of the way as you're going around that radius. The Ellsworth bump, which David Ellsworth doesn't, uh, doesn't claim, I think is a mistake. When you're sharpening this tool and if you uh, well you, you've got more metal when, when you're coming around your wheel uh, you've got a lot of metal right here that's hitting the wheel and a little bit of metal here so if you're using the same speed when you're sharpening same speed same pressure you're taking off more metal at the tip than you are right here so this hump right there behind the point uh, occurs. If you want to get rid of it, you've got to spend more dwell time right here, more time against the wheel in this position. And you can bring that down. You, you can bring that straight across just by holding the tool without rotating and grinding it away. And then come back and work things out. Oh, sure. Rotate it a little bit. There you go. So y'all can see the flats that he's talking about. There you go. So it's pretty much straight across here, and then it starts going downhill. And that's really the amount of metal that's against the wheel uh, that's causing that. So I like it in these. I have a use for it. This one This one, I tried to get the maximum bump out of it just to prove it to myself. Uh, this tool, worn out by someone else, uh, didn't have another purpose, so I can use it here. I can also go in this way. 
That point is out of the way and I can scrub the surface is what I call it. And you can go pretty much right down to the bottom with that. And you can rock this here at the center line. You can find the point down there, find that center line in the bottom. And you can tell where your high spot is. Mine is right at the entrance right now. And I could have checked two things at that point, how deep, how much farther I had to go. Uh, but now, okay, the contact point is near the bottom, much nearer the bottom, and I've got about three sixteenths more to go. I'm going to pick up this other tool for a little bit. check often. We're looking for a final wall thickness of uh, what Luigi would say is two millimeters. Uh, I'd like to go to a sixteenth of an inch, but uh, I'll stop at about three thirty seconds or two millimeters. All right, so about three eighths of an inch inside, you know, I've got a hump. Still in that same position. Need to take some wood out of there. Got a new location to work on. <sighs> All right, so when you're looking here and you think you've got three thirty seconds to go, when it gets a little closer, you can put one point over here and probably read this one, that's about a quarter of an inch. Uh, so half of that, probably got an eighth of an inch to go. Okay. Um, I'm on the center line in the bottom and I put this point on the wall and I'm reading this distance right here and dividing it by two. That will be the depth, the additional depth I have to achieve. Okay. Dan, Pretty consistent. Yes. Does it matter if you go too deep? If you go too deep, if you've got enough wood left back here, then you can come back and, and face off a little bit more to get where you need to be. But with a little practice, you know, you can go in and scrub that surface this way. You can come over here and treat it just like a bowl. Uh, or you can start in the center and come out to the edge. 
they all work. All right, I've still got a little bit to go. We're not gonna, we're gonna abbreviate this a little bit because we're gonna run out of time here eventually. Just a little, just a touch more. And I think we're going to call this one good. <laughs> That's really close. So we'll call that one good. Okay. Now I'm looking for a sixteenth to three thirty seconds wall thickness and uh, I'll set that at about three thirty seconds and I see that's just about what I've got right there. I want to see some gap as I go around this. So mm. So it's a half round bow. So there I'm, I'm tight again at about three eighths of an inch down. Can you see that, sir? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then it gets tight right there. So that's where I'm gonna start my next cut. And it didn't make that curve very much. You can scrape this a little bit. Try to get your radius back. But most of the time, you're going to get chatter. All right, we're down there. Notice I left as much wood back here as I could for as long as I can. A little hemispherical bowl. There's that chatter. getting thin and getting farther away from the base. So a little bit of chatter you can sand away, but uh, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. How's that showing up on the camera? Got two flutes going down in here. Make sure you use one at a time. Disastrous things can happen if you try to use them both at the same time.
look like a bowl yet? Oh yeah, not bad. I'm not going to worry about sanding that perfect at the moment. I'm going to stop it right there. At that point, uh, we'll take that piece out and do exactly the same thing to the top end. But we've already done that. And after I did that, I glued the two together. Use that tailstock for alignment. And see what we come up with. Hello. Yeah, it'll be close enough for now. This piece I was going to do something else with. I put a different color wood in the center. So we'll bring that up there lightly. Anyway, glued that together. If I had to get it off the lathe, uh, bring the, uh, oh, oh, I've got another little tool here that I didn't show you. No, I don't. I didn't. Anyway, I've got a golf ball that's hollowed out that fits on this. And if you just need a little bit of pressure and you don't want to worry about having an exactly centered golf ball up against here, really works great. I forget who it was that uh, got that from, but uh, it does work nice. So glue these two together, get them as close as you can, and it may not be perfect, and this one certainly is not. And We'll get rid of the bottom end of this one. Got to get used to the new lathe, huh? Interesting sound. Now remember, this thing's only 16th or so, so thick. Uh, before I get rid of the tail center, I want to do some sanding. Because this is near, if you can see it, it's not really round yet at all. And It didn't, it slipped when the, it was glued up, so I got a lip on this side. And over here, it's uh, pretty smooth. So I got to get rid of about a 30 second of material over here. Uh, I'll start that, since it's so much, I'll start it with the lathe off.
little chatter from before and get rid of that. Got rid of the extreme roughness. Doesn't look very spherical, does it? It could be a lot better. Uh, I think I was thinking about the universal joint too much when I was preparing, <laughs> preparing for this demo. And I could probably be using coarser sandpaper at this point. Uh, Parting tool. But the surprising thing is it doesn't have to be perfect. When you're carving 75% of the wood away, there's not a lot, lot, a lot left to see. So at this point, we're guessing where the inside is. But we know it's there. <laughs> the we also know that we did a perfect job with that radius gauge. So we, so we know exactly where the inside is, okay? All right, before that gets me in trouble, let's get hey, Dan, any reason you use the parting tool instead of like a spindle gouge or a, uh, a sharper kind of gouge? Oh, uh, yeah, because I'm just, I'm just comfortable with it. Uh, it and it does, you know, uh, it doesn't take much wood away at a time. Uh, so uh, I'm not interested in getting a catch or putting undue force on that. Should it get a little bit thin here? Uh, Got to be careful with that thing breaking off uh, that you don't break a hole through the bottom. So let's try. That could be part of it, but it may be that there's a platform in there holding some trees or something and 
and you don't want to lose it because that stuff is already inside. When you're, when you're doing the inside stuff, it's already there. So here we can clean this up with sandpaper. And I really should have brought some coarser paper. Okay. Perfect. Perfectly spherical. So at this point, once this is the best you can get it, uh, then we'll come in here and, and form that little hanging finial, if you will. I use a quarter inch round nose scraper a lot to get in these little tight spaces. And uh, well, you, you saw them, uh, you saw the piece go by and how that, that shaped. Uh, so that's what I would do here. We have another variation on this. Well, we haven't gotten to the piercing yet. Uh, you ever watch paint dry? How, how long? How long does it take? Well, it, it takes a while. Watching grass grow, watching paint dry. Piercing. Piercing, yes. And I normally mark my chuck jaws on these pieces. But uh, didn't this time. All right, this one hasn't been finished sanded yet. That came out pretty close, so it won't take much. On this particular one, this, this one is designed for a finial and an icicle. So uh, after I did, well, actually before, when I, when I cut the two pieces in half initially, then I took a 5 8 drill and went all the way through. Uh, so I got that here. There's also one up here. Uh, so this one is, is going to turn out to be a finished piece somewhere along the line, I think. You see that glue line? Can you see that? Let's see if we can make it go away. So it's better than it was but not going away. And I use different colored glues on different colored woods sometimes.
You can still see some of it dynamic, but static, it's, it's pretty much going away. So this end is done, but before I cut it off of there, I use guidelines for my piercing. And if I set something, oops, 7 sixteenths, 7 sixteenths. In this case, the uh, icicle will overlap some of that. I want to get pretty close, but I don't want to get into that area. But I'll try to get that similar around there. And if you can see it, you'll see that the two center ones are 16th of an inch farther apart than the rest of them. And that's just because I want to try to get all the holes the same size. Some experts have said use different size holes. And I've got my style and they've got theirs. So. I'm just not real comfortable, Chuck, getting down in this with anything but a small parting, parting tool. Supposed to be a five-eighths hole through there. Thought there was. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, so that little bit we can finish up sanding by hand. There's a hole in this Okay. Okay, so we can we can put a finio in here and an icicle in here when this is done. All right, uh, fifteen minutes. You can make these things out of just about anything. Uh, hard maple is great. Cherry is good, uh, but probably too dark. I, kinda, I think I like the lighter colors. Holly works well, but you can make them out of oak, anything, anything you want. Uh, spalted maple. didn't get, get out enough air hose. So, uh, piercing. I use a Vortex tool that I bought from sculpting studios or something in Washington State. And it's been very good. It's, it, it's cut a lot of holes for me. And I wore out, I thought, the turbine, but uh, I wore out the nose bearing sent it back to them, they replaced it for 50 bucks. Uh, wasn't bad, 50 bucks when I paid 400 for it to start with. Uh, I would like to have another one, Jim, uh, the angled, like the dentist uses. Uh, I ordered one once and got in trouble with a credit card in China, so canceled that credit card and never did, never did get my piece, but my hand piece. But if you ever order any more, get me one, please. Like, like to have it. Okay, 
uh, these things operate at uh, uh, 35, 38 PSI. So regulator, engage, and filter. Oh, did oh, do, do. there, there we are. And I don't need the fancy board and stuff to mount this thing to. It just lays there and does nothing. So we've got a little air valve for control. Yeah. You want you want me to turn this way? Okay. So I, I try to get a little creative in the shape, but try to keep the holes relatively consistent. You do burn the edges, and I, I don't like the burn because it generally burns uneven. You'll get black spots and white spots. So I come back and scrub this off. And it also helps clean the burr because there are sugars in the wood and the burr loads up pretty good. Uh, it, it varies. Uh, I've used one on a complete uh, ornament once, I think. Pardon me? They do, and I can't remember the number right now, but... Uh, Wait a minute, what do I do with them? Before I drill through my arm, turn that thing off. I think it's called a fissure. And this is a straight fissure. that around. If you get lucky, you'll find a dentist that uses these things on one patient and then sterilizes them and uses them in the lab and he gets more than he can use and he'll give them to you. That one's used. If you make these the right size, you know, the lathe is a perfect place to lay it down. It won't roll off on the floor. So, Every few holes, I'll go around here and scrub that black away. You got to go in the right direction. It's it's just like uh, using a router. Uh, you go in the wrong direction, you're going to be in trouble. It it'll eat right through that little piece, and it, then you've got a repair to make. Always good to have a fan next to you, blowing this smoke and, and a little bit of fine dust over there to <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> let, let Chuck have it. <laughs> and uh, you know, even at that, it still gets smoky in the shop. This thing is supposed to be turning at half a million RPM. I don't know how they measure that. Uh, one, that's one of the selling points of this one. The competitors only got up to about 380,000 and this one was 480 to 500. I don't know, I've never used the other one. Yep, 
you get in these corners, you've got to learn to strike it. If you dwell, you get a new burn. This might be pretty wood, but uh, I think it's got a lot of sugar in it. The sugar maple ring a bell. So it's going to take a while. Oh. Uh, so the wall thickness of that you said was three thirty seconds. Maximum. Okay. You go any more than three thirty seconds, and you'll spend the rest of your life trying to pierce it because. It, okay. uh, and again, that depends on the material. So let's let's work on this piece of oak and see. Oops. Sorry. Oak is going to take a while. <laughs> and you can see the thickness. Uh, you know, it's about the same thickness, but probably too thick. It, it should be near a sixteenth of an inch, and yeah, I'm just scared. Yeah, it's a little that, that's, fear keeps us from turning thin, right? I wonder what this one will do. See that matching grain right there? It's going to go away. <laughs> We're not, not going to need it. This one's going to clean up easy. Easier. Now, if you look on the inside of these, you'll be able to see the glue joint. It's not, a, not exactly true on the inside. It wasn't true on the outside, but I sanded it true. Couldn't get on the inside to sand it. So, uh, but in the overall scheme of things, typically is not noticed. Uh, and I don't know, if you probably can't see that in. The Glue joint, yep. Yeah, anyway, pass it around. The one thing I wanted to mention. I was trying to find it, Dan. I couldn't with the zoom because it's not there. Yes, it did. One one thing I wanted to mention when you when you glue these. Uh, just get a, a thin coat of glue. Don't have anything running inside. Uh, on the, yeah, and you can wipe it pretty much smooth with your finger and, and blend it over the surface. Uh, but get rid of any excess glue because eventually it will be seen. You just want a little bitty bead on that surface. You use CA or yellow? I use yellow and I use white and I have used brown. Uh, Depending on the wood, no, I don't. I don't use. Not CA, right? Not CA. I, yeah, I, not I haven't figured out how to use CA. Number one, you put it on and it runs everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's not strong enough. No, I use tight bond and Elmer's and. Uh, 
and uh, you know try to get that uh, get that joint as clean as possible so you don't see any line at all in the end what do you think everybody gonna run out Everybody going to run out and buy a $400 carver and start doing this? Uh, well, oh, I, I didn't mention that. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how, much, how many chips these things keep out of your underwear. Because you get them in your socks and throw them in the washer, and guess where they end up? Ha, 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 ha.